honor. As a verb, it means to observe with respect, to hold in high esteem, to admire. As a noun, it's about recognition, a distinction, a merit that deserves acknowledgement. Boiling it down, honor is all about respect, and our hunger for respect starts young. Accolades, achievements, promotions, trophies, titles, bonuses, blue ribbons. We scratch and scrape for them. Our honors, our accolades. However, there is one award, the most costly to ever exist. Yet no man or woman desires to achieve it. The Purple Heart. While many of the recipients are the wounded warriors living among us, today we honor the service men and women who received the Purple Heart for giving up their lives while defending our country. This award reflects the highest form of sacrifice, one's self. These service members sacrificed so that we can live free. Our country, our families, each one of us, we are all honored by their sacrifice. And today, we honor them by remembering Well, hello again, everybody. We're so glad that you're with us again today, and uh, we're excited about sharing another message with you from the book of Acts. We are finally at the end of chapter number 23, and uh, are going to be winding down this series over the next several weeks, and so we're glad that you've been with us through the long haul. It's been a blessing for me to preach through the book of Acts. I hope it's been a blessing to you to uh, listen to these messages and, and study the book of Acts for yourself, and certainly a wonderful reminder of God's working in the early church. And uh, one of the things that you see woven throughout the book of Acts, as well as throughout Scripture, is uh, what we refer to as the sovereignty of God. And uh, you may hear that word a lot, especially uh, when you're listening to maybe a religious broadcast or something like that. You'll hear people talk about the sovereignty of God. And you certainly see it in this chapter, I think, as well as throughout the book of Acts and throughout all of Scripture. 
But oftentimes you will hear people say, uh, God is sovereign. And uh, when people are going through difficulties and problems, uh, even in this uh, pandemic, I've heard people say, God is sovereign. And uh, when people are going through good times and things are going well and things are uh, going, uh, in, you know, the, the way that they want them to go, they'll, they'll thank God and they'll say something to the effect that God is good or God is sovereign. Uh, but what does it really mean for God to be sovereign? I think with any word, and when we're having a, a conversation, it's important to define our terms. Sometimes uh, two people will be using the same vocabulary, the same words, but they'll have different meanings. Oftentimes you will hear, uh, 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 you know, even cults use what I refer to as uh, Christianese or Christian language. They'll use theological terms, but their definition of those theological terms are far different than maybe the definition that Scripture gives for those same terms. Uh, and that Orthodox Christianity would give for those same terms. So it's important that we define our terms when we're having a conversation. And the word sovereignty is not a word that we probably use in our everyday vocabulary when we're talking to our children or talking to people at work or whatever the case might be. But it is a word that comes up often in religious discussions and at church. And so I think it's important that we understand what sovereignty is if we're going to be able to identify it in Scripture and identify it in, in life. And so that's kind of what I want us to talk about today, uh, to understand what sovereignty is, but also to understand what sovereignty is not. Uh, and then to see from Scripture, from this passage of Scripture, a real-life example of what I believe to be God's sovereignty at work. And uh, then we're going to look at, finally, uh, what difference does sovereignty make in my life? What, what does God's sovereignty mean for me? And so uh, really this is probably a message I probably should try to divide up into four different messages, but I'm going to try to combine them all into one and maybe we can look at this more in the future. But I want to begin by answering the question, what sovereignty is not? Uh, when some people think of sovereignty, they they think of what some theologians refer to as theistic determinism. In other words, God causes everything that happens. They would believe that for God to be sovereign, he must cause every event. Uh, this is the view that Norman Geisler says was held by uh, Puritan theologian Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Norman Geisler says theistic determinism is the view that all events, including man's behavior, are caused or determined by God. Uh, he says one of the most famous advocates of this view was the Puritan theologian Jonathan Edwards. He maintained that the concept of free will or self-determinism contradicted the sovereignty of God. If God is truly in control of all things, then no one could act contrary to his will which is what self-determinism must hold. Hence, for God to be sovereign, he must cause every event, be it human or otherwise. Well, is that really what we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God? Well, if you take theistic determinism to its extreme, then God ultimately would be the cause of sin and sinful acts. And we know that that's not possible because that would violate God's holiness. God does not go against his nature. Another uh, well-known hardline determinist, Gordon Clark, uh, said this. Not only did God cause Pharaoh to hate the Israelites, he caused Hitler to march into Russia and caused Johnson to escalate a war in Vietnam. He would go on to say, it is clear that man's will is not free but it is directed by the working of God. So when we talk about the sovereignty of God, does that mean that mankind does not have a free will? Well, obviously there are some people that think so. Now there are some uh, uh, determinists, we might say, that are not as hard line as Gordon Clark or as Jonathan Edwards. Sometimes they are just deterministic from a salvation perspective. But others like him literally believe that God is the cause of every act of mankind. But do we really believe uh, that God caused Hitler to conduct, 
cruel experiments on those that he created in his image? Do we really believe that God is behind child molestation and rape? Do we really believe that God is causing our sin and the sin of others? No, oh, dear friend, God is holy. He is absolutely holy. And he has never been the cause or author of sin. Now, he has allowed those he created with a limited free will that we'll talk about in a moment. He's allowed those that he created with a limited free will to go their own way and to, and, and to suffer the consequences of those sinful choices. There have been times that God has revealed things would happen as a result of mankind's wickedness and his removal of his hand of protection from the children of Israel. But he's not been the cause or the author of those sinful acts. So if sovereignty does not mean that God causes everything, then what does it mean? Well, let's take a moment and think about the question, what sovereignty is. I think uh, Dr. Robert Piccarelli gives a great explanation of the sovereignty of God. He says these words in his book, Grace, Faith, and Free Will. He says, God is sovereign, the absolute monarch of the created universe. In brief, God's sovereignty means that he is absolutely free to act as he wills and in accord with his own nature. There are no obligations on God's part to anyone or anything outside himself. There are no limitations imposed on him or his actions by anyone or anything other than his own will and attributes. So we, as and I say we, as free will Baptists, for instance, believe that God does, or, or that the Bible does teach, both the sovereignty of God and the limited free will of man. There are some that do not think that these two can coexist. They believe that if mankind has a free will, then God cannot be sovereign. And if God is sovereign, then man must not have a free will. But what if? What if the sovereign God of the universe, in his sovereignty, chose to give mankind a free will? What if God, in his sovereignty, chose to allow man to exercise a limited free will. If that's the case, and I believe it is, then God's sovereignty is not diminished when man chooses to do what God has allowed him to do. Dr. Leroy Fourline states, God purposed to create human beings with a free will. He purposed that they would be free to obey him or disobey him, to please him or displease him. And it turned out that Adam and Eve disobeyed God. God obviously did not desire that they disobey him. Such an attitude would have been prohibited by his holiness. Their disobedience did not mean that God ceased to be sovereign. While we believe that the sovereign God of the universe has given mankind a free will, as I said a moment ago, it is a limited free will. What do we mean by that? Well, Four Lines goes on to say that freedom of will is, is a freedom within a framework of possibilities. It is not absolute freedom. There are some people that misunderstand what we mean when we say free will. They think that we mean absolute freedom. No, we mean we are free uh, within the framework of possibilities that God has given to us. He would go on to say, for instance, we cannot be God. We don't have the free will to be God. We cannot be an angel. We can't wake up one day and say, oh, I'm an angel today. We don't have that free will. That's not within the framework of possibilities God has given us. But the freedom of a human being is in the framework of possibilities provided by human nature. Also, the influences brought to bear on the will will have a bearing on the framework of possibilities. Before Adam and Eve sinned, it was the, in the framework of possibilities within which they operated to remain in the practice of complete righteousness or to commit sin. But after they sinned, it no longer remained within the framework of possibilities for them to practice uninterrupted righteousness. And the same is true for fallen man now. If anyone reads the meaning of freedom of the will to mean that an unconverted person could practice righteousness and not sin, he misunderstands the meaning of freedom of will for fallen human beings. Romans 8, 7, and 8 makes it clear that Scripture does not teach this. Those verses say, 
For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Did you get that? We have a free will within the parameters that the sovereign God has set forth for us. When Adam and Eve freely chose to disobey God, the framework of possibilities changed. We're no longer able to please God apart from the imputed righteousness of Christ. Notice again that verse, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It is outside of the framework of possibilities for an unregenerate person to please God. It is outside of the framework of possibilities for a mind that is set on the flesh to submit to God's law. So we're not saying that mankind has an unlimited free will. He just has a free will within the framework of possibilities that the sovereign God has given to him. So when we talk about free will, we're not talking about this unlimited freedom. Our free will must be exercised within the parameters or the framework of possibilities that the sovereign God has set forth. I'll leave you with one more quote before we move on. This is again by Dr. Piccarelli from his book. He says, God is able to govern the truly free exercise of men's wills in such a way that all goes according to his plan. A God who created a complex universe inhabited by beings pre-programmed to act out his will for them would be great. But one who can make men with wills of their own and set them free to act in ways he has not determined for them and still govern the whole in perfect accord with his purpose is far greater. So in conclusion, the sovereign God of the universe sovereignly chose to give mankind a limited free will within the framework of possibilities that he sovereignly set forth. The real free choices of mankind cannot and do not thwart his plan or purposes. He will do what he pleases, and he will accomplish his purposes, and he will accomplish his purposes in and through our free will, or even in spite of our free will. So now I, I hope we've established what sovereignty is and what sovereignty isn't. Let's move on to our passage of Scripture here in Acts 23. And it, just as I did last week, I'm not going to take the time to read all of these verses, but kind of summarize them as we go along here. Um, in Acts chapter uh, number 23, uh, we find that there are over 40 Jews who make a, a covenant or a vow uh, not to eat or drink anything until Paul is dead. And so Paul's nephew gets wind of this plot. And Paul takes this information, or excuse me, Paul's nephew takes this information to Paul and lets him know of their scheme, of their plan to have him killed. Paul tells his nephew to go to the uh, uh, Roman soldier in charge and let him know of this plot. And as a result, as a result, this is so awesome, as a result, uh, he has all of these people uh, guarding Paul and moving him out at a time that w was uh, uh, kind of in the middle of the night uh, so that these Jews that have made this plan to kill Paul are not aware that he's being moved. I think you see the sovereignty of God in that. Uh, th think about this with me. We know from verse 11 of this chapter that the sovereign God of the universe had decreed that Paul was going to make it to Rome. We talked about that last week. And so even though these Jews had freely chosen to make this vow and try to kill Paul, they were not going to thwart God's plan. Why? Because God is sovereign. Now did God cause them to have this plan to try to kill Paul? I don't think so. He didn't cause them to have this plan, but he allowed them to have this plan. It was within the framework of possibilities that God gave them the choice of whether or not they were going to believe Paul's message and accept the, the truth of Paul's message and the resurrection of Jesus, or to reject that message, and as a result, want Paul dead. 
And so they chose to want Paul dead. And God said, Paul, you're going to get to Rome. Uh, you've testified of me here. I'm going to make sure you get to Rome. So it doesn't matter what these men chose. The sovereign God of the universe was going to make sure that Paul got to Rome. And so they were not going to thwart God's plan. Which leads me to something else. The fact that God always keeps his promises. No matter what the circumstances are. And no, ma no matter what other people may choose. Does not affect the promises of God whatsoever. So God did not cause the Jews to take this vow. It was not God's will for them to kill Paul. Yet he gave them the freedom to choose when they were going, uh, what they were going to attempt to do. But that did, did not limit or diminish God's sovereignty. So these Jews concoct this plan in verse 15 to kill Paul. However, uh, the sovereign God of the universe also has a plan. You see, he knows and sees everything from the beginning to the end. Nothing takes him by surprise. He orchestrated the events to ensure that their plan would be thwarted and that his plan would be accomplished. God arranged or allowed for Paul's nephew to overhear this plot and report it to Paul, who then directed him to report it to the Roman official in charge. You can read about that in verses 16 through 22. As a result... Paul was guarded by over 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Look at these verses in verses 23 and 24. Then he called two of the centurions and said, Get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that an amazing picture of the sovereignty of God that he works within and in spite of the free choices of mankind to accomplish his will? He used the ungodly Roman government and almost 500 of their men to protect his servant because, after all, he said Paul was going to go to Rome and therefore Paul was going to go to Rome regardless of the free choices of the Jews that made the vow to kill him. Again, I quote Dr. Forlines who says, if God says something will happen, it will happen. But that is not the same thing as saying that there was an exact correlation between what God desires and what follows. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. The Bible says that God desires all to be saved. But we know that not all will be saved. Does that somehow diminish the sovereignty of God? No, because the sovereign God is the one who has given man a free will uh, after he has been moved upon by the Holy Spirit to either receive or reject the message of Christ. He goes on to say, I think we can safely say God does not desire for lying, hatred, murder, rape, and thievery to occur. At the same time, this does not mean that God will not accomplish the purposes he sets before him. So in this passage of Scripture, I think you see the sovereignty of God. You see God giving, sovereignly giving these Jews a choice. They could choose to uh, receive the message. They could re choose to reject the message. They chose to reject the message, and as a result of rejecting the message, they rejected the messenger, and as a result of rejecting the messenger, they wanted the messenger dead. That's what they chose. They chose to make a vow to kill Paul. But God had other plans. And so their free choices were not going to thwart or disrupt God's plans whatsoever. God said Paul was going to get to Rome. And so God used the Roman government in his sovereign plan to be the very, one that, very ones that guarded Paul uh, to keep him safe from these 40 plus Jews that wanted him dead and make sure that he got to the next step on the way to Rome safely. And how did he do that? He just happened to allow Paul's nephew to overhear a conversation about their plot. And that's the sovereignty of God. God's plans will not be thwarted regardless of the free choices of man. And so what does that mean for us? It's wonderful to know about the sovereignty of God. It's wonderful to, to hear people talk about it and hear sermons about it and maybe even hear uh, music about it, songs about it. But what does it mean for us? Well, there's a lot that it means for us, and there's no way in one message could I share with you all that it means for us, but there are three things that came to my mind 
So number one, if God is sovereign, I do not need to worry. If God is sovereign, if God is in control, if God's plans are not going to be thwarted, if God's promises are all going to come true, then I don't need to worry. God is in control. He upholds the universe and everything in it by the word of His power. I have no need to fret or worry. I can rest in Him. I can rest in His goodness. I can rest in His control, His power, His purpose. He tells us over and over again in Scripture to trust Him. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, He tells us, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 5, 7, Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. I can take those worries, those anxieties, all of those things, and I can cast them on Him. Because I know that He cares for me. Because I know that He's in control. Because I know that His promises are going to come true. Because I know that He's going to still be on the throne tomorrow. I can trust and rest in God's sovereignty. I don't have to worry. Secondly, if God is sovereign, bad choices do not mean that all is lost. If God is sovereign, bad choices do not mean all is lost. God can work in bad choices. God can work through bad choices, and God can work in spite of bad choices. Now, that does not give us a license or an excuse to go out and make bad choices. But we've all made bad choices. We all have, can look back in our past and say, man, I blew it. I made a bad choice. I made a bad decision. I, 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 I chose the wrong path, whatever it means. And, and, and that, does that mean my life is completely a wreck, totally over? No. Because God is sovereign and He can work in and through those bad choices. A prime example of that is Joseph and his brothers. His brothers made a horrible choice to hate him and to sell him. And he ended up going to Egypt. Was it God, did God cause his brothers to hate him? Did God cause his brothers to sell him? I don't think so. But God worked in and through and in spite of their horrible choice to make sure Joseph could get to a place in Egypt where he would be in charge. And later on, guess what happened? He fed those brothers that might would have starved otherwise. You see the sovereignty of God working through people's bad choices. He can take my bad choices, the things that I've done in my past, and he can still redeem those things for my good and for his glory. God's plan was not thwarted by Joseph's brother's sinful choices. And maybe you've made some bad choices, maybe horrific choices. And these choices have caused you a lot of pain and a lot of agony, but you can take comfort in knowing that the in the sovereignty of God that He can redeem those choices. Maybe you've made bad choices in your life and you wish you could a thousand times go over and do it differently to rewind history, but we know that we cannot do that. That's not within the framework of possibilities that God's given us. But you can take those choices to the cross. You can confess those choices as sin, repent of them, and trust God to give you back the years that the locusts have eaten. Joel 2.25 talks about that. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter. Talking about judgment that had come, that God said, I'm going to bring, I'm going to restore those years back to you. The third thing, the final thing this morning is, if God is sovereign, I know He will keep His promises. I don't have to worry. It doesn't mean that bad choices mean, means that all is lost. And number three, if God is sovereign, I know He's going to keep His promises. He, he, he made a promise to Paul. He said, Paul, you're going to testify in Rome. Verse 11. He said, you're going to do it. And these 40 men said, no, it's not going to happen. He, he's going to be dead. And God said, no, he's not going to be dead. I made a promise to Paul that he's going to testify in Rome. And Paul's going to testify in Rome. And it's not within the framework of possibilities for you to mess up my plan. And so God made sure that Paul got to Rome. We see God's sovereignty in that. And I promise you, dear friend, not based on my authority, but on God's authority. The Word of God says that God cannot lie.
He cannot lie. And so he's going to keep his promises. And there's nothing that anybody on the face of this earth can do about it. Nobody can cause God not to keep his promises. One million promises may be broken by man, but God will never break one of his. It matters not what man may choose. It matters not what governments may do. It matters not what may happen. God will keep his promises, and God's purposes will be accomplished. Again, Dr. Forline says, No one can defeat God's purposes. A person can disobey God and will be held responsible for that disobedience. However, God has purposes that are carried out in spite of disobedience. And he references the story of Joseph and his brothers. And so today, as we conclude, the invitation is simple. Number one, will you entrust your sins to God's forgiveness and your soul to God's sovereign care? The Bible says, to many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. God has, has given you the, the choice, the freedom of will. It's in, within the framework of possibilities that the sovereign God has assigned for you to choose to receive or reject him. You say, but I thought the Bible says that no man can come to the Father except the Spirit draw him. That's correct. We have to have the Spirit's drawing. But because I know that God is not willing that any should perish, I'm going to assume that he is going to draw everybody at some point in their life. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to get saved. That doesn't mean everybody's going to choose to call on the name of the Lord to be saved. We know that from Scripture. But how about you? Will you call on his name today? Will you receive him today and be made a child of God? He's given you that opportunity. But he's also given you the opportunity to say no, the freedom to say no. He doesn't want you to perish. But neither does he want you to choose uh, him and love him because you couldn't do otherwise. In his sovereignty, he's chosen to give the offer of salvation to whosoever will. If you've already received him and he's already made you a child of God, this means that your soul... Uh, you have rested your soul in God's sovereignty. Can I encourage you to rest everything else there too? You've rested your soul in God's sovereignty. Why not rest your children there? Why not rest your finances there? Why not rest your marriage and your relationships there? Why not rest your fears there? Why not rest your mistakes there? Why not rest everything there? In God's hands. Because He is sovereign. I want to pray for you right now before we close. Dear God, I pray for those that have watched this message today. That they would understand and realize who you are. That they would understand and realize that you're in control. That you're sovereign. And though people may make bad choices. And though may people may mistreat them as they, mis as they mistreated Paul. God, your promises are not diminished. Your plan is not thwarted. Your purposes have not changed. Help them to rest in you. If there's someone watching this right now and they don't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that they would make that free will choice as you draw them to yourself to call on the name of Jesus and be saved. That may cry out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I need Jesus to forgive me and save my soul. I pray for every believer, every Christian watching this today, that they too would rest everything in your sovereignty. Whatever fears, whatever failures, whatever things they're struggling with today, may they cast those anxieties on you. Your shoulders are big enough to carry them all. You say, cast our cares on you because you care for us. Thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name. Amen. It hurts to see you this way.
lost for words There's so much I am wanting to say Though I don't understand I'll hold your hand I'll hold your hand If I had it my way I'd take this from you But God, He knows what He's doing So here while our hearts break We have to believe that God Yes, our God, He knows what He's doing. He's never failed us before. He has shown us His goodness, His love will endure. His ways are higher than our own. Whatever the road, whatever the road, if I had in my way, I'd take this from you, but God, He knows what He's doing. So here while our hearts break, we have to be. God, He knows what He's doing. So here while our hearts break, we have to be. 